So the agenda I wanted to go through, um, and on the sign out there it said advanced scaling, and uh, um, I changed the title to reality um, in the fact that uh, this is something that we've actually done. This is something that we've got out to, to customers and uh, we kind of have, I guess, the scars to show for it and, uh, and really wanting to, to kind of alleviate some of those problems for other people wanting to take up Neo4j. So I'm going to go over why we chose it, how we sc uh, scaled to millions of nodes and millions of relationships, how we achieved uh, graph multi-tenancy, and f for those who don't know this terminology, it essentially means what if we could have uh, multiple people's data all shared in the same graph? Um, security control in the graph. Uh, Rick talked a little bit about the fact that uh, we've got all these different databases to choose from, document, columnar type databases, graph, and uh, relational. And security is always inherently one thing that was okay in relational databases, but all the other types really suffer from security and at what points you apply security, if that is a problem for you. Finally, we'll go into how we uh, implemented uh, application level sharding, and this is giving us the confidence that we will be able to scale to billions upon billions of nodes. And uh, two more things, how it's like running Neo4j in production, um, and uh, tips and tricks. I'm going to say this, you can edit this out later, but it feels like there's a condom hanging off my ear. <laughs> Not that that's ever happened to me, ever. But anyway, and uh, we'll just go through some... <laughs> that was the other ear. <clears throat> okay, so essentially, I think um, you need to know... Uh, there's one slide. I don't want to come here to talk about this product. I want to talk about Neo4j and how we utilized it. Um, but you kind of need one slide on what we do to understand why we chose it and why we modeled our data like this. So essentially, this is your company. You use all of these different tools, and some of them even span the same thing. Chat, project management, to-do lists, mail, file storage, and so forth. And so what we do in our product at Clued-In is we just hook into all of these providers or integrations and we pull the data from them and then we run it through an intelligence engine where we start to extrapolate some intelligence out of it. This ends up being it goes into Neo and then it goes into a search index and then it also goes into a relational data store, a distributed cache and a message queue as well just because it was fun. No, it was necessary. So this is our stack. Um, and uh, it's quite a complex sta uh, stack, but I guess this is what you would refer to as that kind of polyglot architecture where you've got the different building blocks that you need to do a specific job very well. If you're doing aggregations, relational databases do that extremely well. If you're doing path traversals, of course, graph. If you're doing index lookups, full text querying, course, that's why you would use search indexing. So we have a couple other things in there. Um, we use SignalR as a push engine and uh, RabbitMQ, which is a message queue system, as kind of like our backplane, which allows us to distribute our application over as many servers as we want, because everything just goes onto this message queue and is consumed off the end of it. So when we came to choose a technology, we had to kind of identify some key things that we were looking for a graph database to solve. Cross-application search, so the ability to search through nodes. Automatic content relation extraction. So translation, this just means being able to read raw content and try to extract some intelligence out of it. And that intelligence would typically end up in edges to other nodes. Rick gave the example of uh, Rick <coughs> likes drinking beer, or likes beer, so those types of relationships. Um, and what we also needed from a graph database was to leverage this information to deliver feeds to people, like you would see on Facebook or, or alike. Um, and uh, finally, to find the relationships between people. So if you're in a big organization and you want to find out what do me and Jimmy have in common, kind of like the path 
example that Rick gave before where you met at beers, well, this would probably meet at documents or projects or something like this. So this is what we kind of had as a um, list of requirements for choosing the database. And I guess this is where the roller coaster part starts, in that while taking upon Neo4j, um, there were some really good parts and some really not so great parts. And uh, I think I was in good hands when I was trained. I was trained by uh, Jim uh, Weber, who at the time was the CTO. I don't know what he is now. Chief there you go. Um, and like Rick, I had frigging no idea about Doctor Who. So this went, it went like this for content, but for the actual uh, information inside, it was great. So let's start. I'll, I'll say this into the, the camera because this might end up in one of those Neo4j reels um, later on. Um, Neo4j is the easiest product to pick up and just work with. All right, now it's out of the way. Um, uh, actually, it's true. I've used uh, lots of different uh, database technologies, and I, I really stand by this. I'm really genuine in this that Neo4j is the easiest database to pick up and just play with and just work with. Um, it starts with not only easy to install and easy to boot up, it then goes into an easy web admin that doesn't send you off to documentation. It just says, here, click this and it will run this query that creates a database for you. Oh, and here's some really interesting queries to run in line. Um, the example they have right now, inbuilt into their web browser, is a, is a movie database. Um, and everyone can kind of relate to, 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 um, to movies. Um, the other good part is the, the data modeling. So the ability to draw out um, a graph and think of it from a business perspective and then kind of easily model your data. I'll come back to this point in the bad parts. Um, it's extremely well documented. It's really well documented. And just the ability to um, have people answer your questions online and then say, oh, and I've written a gist over here where you can just press play and see the results and see how the query runs. It's just really good. Um, uh, it goes without saying that Cypher is like just a really good language. It's, it's SQL made easy. Um, and I'll be going a bit over the tips and tricks of that as well. Um, as you could probably collect from the fact that we're a .NET stack, we could not use the Java API. So Cypher was our kind of only choice. Um, and uh, I've already mentioned the, the fantastic web UI. So um, the not so good parts that need work. I worded that extremely delicately. Um, <laughs> Not need so much work, but I slept on it and I came back the next day and it was okay. Like, that was too much. Okay, so it was mentioned before that uh, there's a lot of indexing that happens in, um, in Neo4j. And just to, like, give the idea of an index over, yes, it is a, a um, lucene underneath. Um, and yes, because Neo4j is a Java-based product, they can always keep up to speed with the latest releases of the um, Lucene, which is at about five now, I think. I haven't been watching. Us poor fellows over in the .NET world are still back at three. Um, and uh, the bottom line is that um, the index, you need to know a lot about Lucene and how it operates to actually use Cypher properly and to make sure that you're modeling and you're marking up your properties with the right indexes and you're setting the right constraints on your data models. Otherwise, for example, sometimes Cypher will just ignore the index. Um, there's a handy little thing that you can do with Cypher queries, and Rick, Rick showed a few, um, is that you can actually tell different parts of the Cypher query, oh, I'm going to hint for you to use the index here. And I would say that there's a lot of myth on the documentation about when that actually kicks in or when it's actually used. And so 
I guess my piece of advice would be just put it in. It can't hurt always hinting to your Cypher queries where to use the specific indexes that you have. Um, and by the way, feel free to stop me at any point if you would uh, like to uh, answer, ask any questions. So this is interesting. I, I put data modeling on the previous, and now I'm putting it on the bad parts. And actually, this is, uh, this is not closed down to Neo itself. Um, the NoSQL kind of push brought on this idea of no schemas, just throw it in the database and you'll be fine. That's really good for small POCs, thousands of nodes, 10,000s of nodes. When you start to get to a million, you'll immediately know that your queries stop working. They take over 100 seconds to run, and uh, it just causes mayhem for the rest of the solution. So I'm going to show you some really good tricks on data modeling, and where in a POC environment you could easily fall for these tricks and uh, how to get out of them. Performance at scale, um, so I would say, like uh, the previous statement, that if you were to just throw a million documents, uh, sorry, a thousand documents into MongoDB, it would be fine. If you were to throw a million into to MongoDB, maybe, it's okay. But as soon as you go past that, you're screwed. Because you haven't applied the right schemas, you haven't applied the right types, and there's a reason <coughs> schemas are there. Um, and um, you'll find that Elasticsearch, Solar, all of these quite mature search indexing products, in the end, after they've told you that, oh, just throw it in, they get you to apply a schema anyway. And a schema just typically means this property is an int, this property is a string, this is a date, and stuff like that, which is, I guess, um, something that you'll just learn by, uh, by falling into those, uh, those traps. Um, and... I kind of think this is kind of like the only negative part of my presentation because I guess um, overall Neo4j is a fantastic product because it gives us these extra choices we did not really have before. Um, but it feels, and uh, I think a lot of systems are like this, like it's never been tested on real life data. It's been tested on movies, on, on um, nodes with small amounts of properties, with small amounts of, uh, like, yes, I'd like a beer. Are you going to get me a beer? Okay. I, okay, got it. <laughs> that worked out in my favor. You can help solve that problem by sending us some data and some queries. Yes, I, yes, yes, definitely. Um, there is a, a statement on the Neo4j website. It's uh, littered over their Slack channel and uh, a lot of other places that we are looking for donations. And it means if you get the clearance for this data, um, the unfortunate thing for us is that typically organizational data is extremely private. Um, and uh, what I would really uh, um, be able to offer is definitely our own internal data. And I'd be happy to uh, get anyone's contact after this to, um, to test this. But um, so what I'm wanting to do is kind of give everyone a cheat sheet. And this is kind of the things that just keep in the back of your mind where after you've done playing with uh, Neo4j and you've dedicated to decide to go forward with this tool, you have to think about these things. And they're broken up into indexing, overall performance, profiling, and security. So it goes without saying that indexing is pretty essential. And uh, there are two ways that you can uh, well, there's actually multiple ways, but uh, at a high level, um, you can set indexes on properties. Or, if you've worked with uh, relational data databases before, you might think about putting some data integrity in place, constraints in place to make sure that no two rows go into the database with the same IDs um, or foreign keys. This is exactly the same type of thing. And in fact, Neo gives you a free index once you put constraints onto your nodes. I'll give you an example. Um, email. Email's kind of, you could think of it as a very unique thing, um, especially within a company. And that's something you could probably think about putting a unique constraint on, because as soon as f at microsoft.com goes into the system and another node goes in with it, 
This will do the check for you and say, no, you can't do that. I'm going to throw you an exception. Um, and it just completely stops this from happening. Um, and um, I uh, talked about this a little bit before, but if you grab a certain uh, Cypher query, um, I mean, this is kind of just magical that a tool has this. I, I applaud the fact that Neo have this is that you can just stick profile at the front of every single Cypher query and uh, it will give you, um, it gives you an expression tree. Um, how many people know what an expression tree is? Okay. Is anyone a .NET developer here? Okay, so um, Java, I won't talk about that. Um, uh, .NET <laughs> has this thing called uh, link that pretty much every other language in the world wants, but they don't have. And essentially what it takes is an expression. This is an expression tree, and it breaks it down into sub-calls, sub-methods. So whenever you write a Cypher query, you can preface it with profile. Don't worry about these yet. And it will break down this expression tree into exactly what it's going to call in the underlying Java API. So it's either a filter or a index lookup or a table scan. And this helps you alleviate those extremely expensive queries where you've just screwed up. And you've act most of the time, it's that you're not using the index. Most of the time, it's that you're doing stupid path traversals they're just spanning the entire graph. So this is a, a lifesaver. Um, I will say that um, there's a huge difference between running this on your local machine, running a profile and getting a query at 23 milliseconds, and then running it on a system under high load. And uh, um, we have personally seen some super odd things happening where some queries use the index and some don't end up using the index. And I'll put this right now down to, um, because we haven't figured it out, it's our fault so far, and it's our problem, but we're definitely looking into it. So just look out for the, um, that one. And one thing that was recently added, cost and rule, was that 2.23? Yeah, so really recent. 2-2, two, two, okay. Oh, three, two, three, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's just two kind of breakdowns of the expression tree evaluation where um, uh, whenever, whenever Neo4j gets a Cypher query, it goes through an execution plan and it goes through a query optimizer where Neo tries to do, and it does do very successfully, some really smart things to optimize your query for you. And you can use cost and rule to kind of say, uh, which, one should, which way should I be pushing my query? Um, try it out and uh, see the results. There's a new type of indexing, and I'm sorry about my versions, this is terrible, but this was also relatively new, schema indexing, where... To, oh, okay, so it's not. Sorry. Um, and all the other support we had before for indexing uh, is now referred to as the legacy indexing. And uh, there are certain things that schema indexing brought as positives, and there's things that it dropped as well. Um, and schema indexing essentially works against these labels or these tags that Rick was referring to. That is, you, if, you, um, if you have a product node, and you stamp it with one of these labels, the schema indexing will index it for you. So you can quickly look that up. Um, and unfortunately, you can't use both. You've got to choose one or the other. Um, and I've got an example later where it really helped and where it sucked. You can't use both um, because of the different versions. So for it, like, remember that we're using Cypher. We can't use the J Java API 
And so potentially, and please answer this uh, if you know it, in the Java API, you can use both. But the Cypher point of view, you can't. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's definitely legacy index rest points that are available, but um, from our, from what we could see, they just weren't using the indexes at all. So, but if you, you know, so, uh, so in the old... Guys, you guys are the technical guys. <laughs> <laughs> no, you do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if you use the star clause... Yes. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, this is fantastic to have you guys here. Um, uh, so there's, a, there's also a myth about using start and not using start. And in uh, the cheat sheets of uh, two and above, they're like, just drop it. Yeah, we're trying not to. To say that? Okay, so it still has a use. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. We still do use it internally. Um, so, for example, let's just say that we want to just dump the whole entire graph. We use the start node and then just iterate through the node IDs um, in transactions so we can get delete in snapshots instead of in a whole database at the same time. So that is good to know. Um, this is nothing wrong with Neo. This is just um, something to be aware of, is that um, uh, Rick used an example of a path. Add a billion nodes, add a million nodes, and suddenly you've got to be really careful about using queries like all shortest paths. Because if you've got dense nodes, a dense node is a single node, lots of things pointing to it, and this is extremely common, such as you as a person, what's everything you've ever worked on in your company? Every check-in you've done, every comment you've done on Slack, every picture you've updated a Dropbox, very dense nodes. These queries won't work on those. Um, and uh, in fact, um, uh, yes, this is, this is um, correct. Um, of course, Neo runs as a Java app on your box, and uh, whether that's on Windows or, or not, it's inside a JVM. And um, uh, if you run these path queries through Cypher, they can completely lock um, the process. And that's if you do these stupid queries. And the symptoms is that, um, uh, that your CPU will stay at this high uh, count, and then it will feel like it's never kind of taken the lock off. And there's a really easy solution for that. In the configuration, well, first of all, don't do stupid <laughs> queries. And in the configuration, you can actually give the lifetime of a query to say, if this runs longer than five seconds, just kill it. Just kill that thread. This problem goes away stra straight away. Um, and, um, sure. Yes, sure. But now, you know, you will get the transaction ID and you can just say... That's a good point. That's a good point. Definitely. Um, because, I mean, you're not the only one that has said this. <laughs> and this is the thing, is that... Um, so we, we, I think we have a good fix for it now. Definitely. I'm hoping here that I can give more of a, like, an overall view of... There is a big difference between reality and POC, and then in... And Neo4j is a fantastic tool. It really is. <laughs> And you're going to run into these issues. You are. We're on two. Th we're on two three milestone two. Uh, we have had to um, do a lot of things. I mean, the thing is that if I kill a query after five seconds, that's fine. That's that's right now. Uh, I wouldn't even go as far to say it's a hack. It's fine. It's a solution for that problem right now. Um, but uh, we're actually probably going to go in production on 2.2.5. Um, oh. Yes. <laughs> yes, trust me, I have the same feeling. <laughs> um, of course, definitely, definitely. 
Um, this is a really good part about Neo4j, I think, and uh, you might see people say this is not a good thing, but I disagree, I think it's a fantastic thing. Neo will chew up everything it gets. And on a local machine, you don't want that. But that's why Neo ships out of the box with defaults for a local machine. So like when you're using 100 Chrome tabs, you absolutely hate it. Um, this just runs smoothly, beautifully. And so just be aware that when you're going into production, of course, you want to tweak those values. And I'll show you which values um, got us some big wins. And they will differ between solutions. But essentially, um, because we pull in a lot of data, so a lot of writes are happening. Um, but then, unfortunately, we also have to do a lot of reads. Because we have to check if things are in the graph in a certain structure before we put it in. And there are some things you could do, like you could go, um, I don't really care if it's in there, just delete it and write over it. And you can get some wins from that, some performance gains. But we didn't want to do that. Um, so the things that instantly gave us in this environment some big boosts was you can boost the number of web server threads that, uh, that uh, Neo uses. I don't actually know the default. Does anyone know? in your CPU, okay. Um, and on a, um, I think on a, yeah, I think we boosted ours up to 24 and it was a sweet spot on a four core machine. Um, the other thing is you can tell Neo its heap size, or the JVM heap size. This is to do with this eating up the RAM. This is fantastic that I can just boost this up and say Neo, if I'm hosting you by yourself on this server, just use everything. Brilliant. And uh, finally, some JVM tuning, which is, um, it's just basically about saying, where do I allocate these parts of memory? How much do I allocate to the Neo cache? How much do I allocate to memory mapped files? So you have all these things to play with. And uh, I mean, we got 10x uh, increase in performance by just tweaking these to the right results. Um, so like I said before, the defaults when you just download Neo and play with it um, are for a single machine, fantastic. Um, I actually don't know if they differ for the enterprise version. If you install the enterprise version, is it the same configuration as the community edition? I don't know. Maybe we can find that out later. So. We couldn't use Java. We luckily had a .NET wrapper for the REST API, and I will give this five out of five. They've done a really good job. Um, and essentially what they've done is kind of an iQueryable link wrapper over the REST interface. So like link in .NET, you can kind of just write these very fluent queries, and it maps to these things, um, which is beautiful. Um, it was done by a guy in Australia, and um, the great news is that for about two years it went silent, but it was still very good. And then just two weeks ago, yeah, yeah they picked it up again. So if you're in .NET and you want to use this, I would highly recommend using the client libraries. They're really good. Um, the uh, by default, when you go to query with the Neo4j client um, for, for .NET, the JSON objects that it gets back are quite heavy, but you can prune that. Um, you can completely project out, go get me these paths, but only project out these properties and these relationships from it. That's always just a good recommendation on any uh, database system to project or select out only what you need. The connections to Neo4j are quite expensive. Um, and what I mean by this is when you boot up your code and say, go talk to that Neo endpoint, that's actually quite expensive. So you can, you can just cache those. And whether that's time-based or if you get um, some indication from the network that I, I, I can't listen to that anymore, you could dump the cache and try and connect again. But they are quite expensive, so just watch out for that. Um, and I've got some queries coming up 
where I can show you what our queries look like to, to Neo4j using these uh, client libraries. Um, and I would only say this because there was that two-year gap, because Neo have been doing so much in two years. There's new features in the Cypher query language and new ways to manipulate it that um, it wouldn't make sense for us to just write these link queries. We still had to write the physical Cypher strings um, and that would execute um, at, the, at the Java endpoint. Um, but the rest of the library is extremely good and there's a lot of uh, good blog posts out there on if you're doing this, just make sure you check for things like parameterizing your queries, using indexes, and, and so forth. And this is all about um, the fact that it actually does take quite a lot of time to take a query like that and map it into an expression tree. And so if you're using parameterized queries, um, then it can cache those expression trees, so it doesn't have to evaluate it every time. And this gets you micro um, milliseconds in, uh, in speed, speed up and performance gain, but overall it's not the biggest problem to, to worry about. So these are some of our queries. Sorry about the zoom. Um, and uh, so essentially we have this client that we've pulled from uh, the .NET library. Then we specify Cypher to say I'm going to give a Cypher query. This supports an old Neo4j language as well called Gremlin, um, but uh, we did not use that. Cypher is just so much more intuitive to, to use, but Gremlin's still a good thing. Um, and uh, basically this just maps into a uh, huge Cypher query string, and uh, Rick told me to put in maybe some of our more complex queries that we have. And um, uh, this is an example where um, we go and find a node by its ID, index lookup. But then what we do is we collect a lot of information that's around it and bring it back in one response. And this is a good uh, piece of advice in any uh, document-based system is Doing everything in one query is much better than doing multiple different, uh, multiple queries. All right? The less you can hit the database, the more you can stuff into one huge Cypher query, typically the better. And uh, Cypher does a fantastic job of this. You can batch writes together, you can batch reads together, um, if you shove them all into the one uh, Cypher query. So essentially what it's doing, getting a Cypher query and then projecting out what values we want from it and then it's typing it, it's strongly typing it um, at the .NET, uh, at the C-sharp level. Um, this is just a very similar one. Um, however, the interesting part about this, um, I will uh, go over a little bit later, but the last one was about get by ID, and this one is more get by um, uh, what we refer to as an entity code, and that is a unique value, it's not an ID, but it's a unique value that represents that node. And they can have multiple. I know it sounds like an oxymoron, but um, think about this. If you had a pitch deck and you put it into SharePoint and then you sent it to your friend on Dropbox and then you uploaded it in a Slack channel, they're all essentially the same document. However, they're referred to as from different IDs in those other systems. So one thing we had to do was change our data model to support this. I'll go over how we changed it in a moment. But these are the kind of queries we're writing against uh, the uh, client library. Just a couple of things. The data modeling is the fantastic part about Neo. It's got some hidden things, and I would say actually most of it comes from our inherent nature to think like SQL databases. Um, and I guess the thing is, don't. Um, and I think Rick explained it very well with the fact that it's the joins are kind of a first level uh, or a, yeah first level citizen. Um, so embrace them um, and utilize them. Um, and one of the things that we uh, well, in my experience, I've been very notorious of 
is in relational databases is just lots of columns. As flat as I can get it, so I don't have to do these joins. And um, you can't do this in the graph. The graph, in our experience, works best small, finite nodes with relationships. The graph is not used for a blob store. You don't store huge blobs in the graph. You don't have nodes with hundreds of properties on it. There are lots of problems that can happen when you get to this level. Um, so these are just some things about data modeling. Finally, the security. Um, well, the security is up to you. There's network level security. So there's base authentication, username and password authentication on the connection string. So you, you don't have to expose that. So it's, it's handled at the network level. But things like read and write, you have to do that yourself. And there's some really kind of interesting things you can do there. But at the end of the day, you have two choices. Do it at write time or do it at query time. And no matter which way you choose, it's always going to affect the query anyway. Because if you do it at query time, the really dirty thing you can do is do a query, check in memory in your application, and just start nulling value with values out. What does this do? It screws with counts, it screws with paging, it screws with aggregation numbers. So that's something you've got to think about. Do you, does that matter to you? Um, and the other thing is indexing time, and that's what we went for, where inside the node, we actually build relationships to people based off if they have read or write. And here's the thing. Neo is really scalable, and I really mean, genuinely mean it, when you've got small nodes with relationships and heaps of them. So then... Adding an extra relationship, add 100. Doesn't really matter. It's really good at that. So what we did is it's, it results in a lot more um, relationships in the graph, but at right time, we put the security of this person has read access to this node. And here's a really interesting thing. I don't know if you noticed this in Rick's presentation, but every edge has a direction on it. And you can choose whether it's ingoing or outgoing or ignore it, which means when you're querying, I could go either way. And you can actually use this to kind of force some hierarchy into your graph. Because after all, a subgraph is kind of a tree until you just add a few more relationships in directions that don't represent a tree. So you can actually build hierarchy with the directions of your relationships to say, there's a node here, and this person, it's a folder, and they do not have read access to it. Well, don't evaluate the rest of the subtree. So this is the kind of things you can do to, to have security in the graph. OK, so when it came to uh, move into our cloud environment and uh, put Neo in there. Um, well, there's lots of support for this. Neo has clustering built in. It has kind of what kind of three levels of support. One is clustering, high availability. The next is high availability with some routing magic. And the final thing is if you want trillions of nodes and just to scale forever, it's actually to use your domain your domain model or some attributes within your graph to shard. We have a really easy one, organization. So we can shove organizations into different shards, different clusters. They could be different parts of the world, different data centers. This is how we know we can always scale as much as we want horizontally. It does become an issue and we haven't met that yet, so maybe I'll come back in a year and say how that one went. But what happens when you've got to be very careful about your shard key that you shard on? I mean, for an organization, you might say, well, everyone's starting with A to C, go on these boxes. D to F, go on these boxes. 
What if every company that signs up for you starts with A? <laughs> You're just going to be bound to that, that cluster. And the thought of then saying, okay, now redistribute that to the other clusters. Some products do that, Neo doesn't. So you'd have to do that manually. And there are lots of good guides on how to move a lot of data into other clusters. So it's definitely possible. Um, <clears throat> The clustering guide to get Neo uh, running. I certainly hope these are whiteboard markers. He's not around, so. Yeah. Sammy. Um, so, the easiest cluster that you can set up in Neo4j is three nodes where you've got one write node or master node, and then you've got to read nodes. So what this means is that all the writing you do to the database goes all through this master, and this master is responsible for syncing with the other boxes. So when your lovely web app says, I need to read very quickly, what does it do? It completely ignores this, and it just goes here. Fantastic. So it's only reading off the read nodes. So there's not a lot of thread contention. There's not a lot of context switching in what the underlying Neo database is supposed to be doing. It can kind of set itself in this way of, OK, read. I'm in the read mindset, so I'm going to optimize myself for reads. So that's the, that's the easiest one. The guide to set this up is so straightforward on Neo. There is only one product that does this better. Can anyone guess? Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch, it's, I don't think it's a hard thing to, for Neo to add. And when you boot up a node in Elasticsearch and you boot one over here, it says, oh, you're on the same network as me, I'll join you. You've got the same cluster name, I'll join you. So if you have... It, it does result in some funny things. Like if you boot up Elasticsearch on your machine and your friend is on the same wireless network and boots it up, suddenly you've got a cluster on your machine. Um, that is quite odd, so it definitely has its downsides. But still, at the same time, just follow the guide. It is dead easy, easy to, to set up the clustering and to catch things. <coughs> okay, so, but the only thing is, I would say that um, if you have a very heavy write system, a cluster like this doesn't really help. Because there's still only one master. And it still has to do a lot of syncing in the background. So it doesn't really help too much. There are different solutions for that. Um, and uh, the other thing is that if you've got multiple of these clusters, um, I actually haven't experimented with this. There's the Neo4j Arbitrator. What, sorry? Arbiter, sorry, sorry. And uh, does that act like a load balancer? No. no. Because of the choosing which one is the right node, you need uh, at least three to yes. get the consensus algorithm. Yep. So if you only have two, then you can put the arbiter. Got it. Got it. Got it, got it, got it. Yes. Got it. So MongoDB does the same thing then. Um, and uh, if you need a proxy with multiple clusters, I mean, I don't, I can only say what we use. I wouldn't recommend it or not recommend it. But we use this thing called HA proxy. Um, it, it does its job. It tells you when clusters go down pretty quickly. Pretty good. Um, there was a funny thing that uh, <laughs> um, where we set up a cluster like this, we ran our tool against it, and we were like, oh my god, this is slow. And queries were running at about 100 seconds, and it was completely our fault. Um, our HA proxy was basically just set up to only read and write off this. And so just watch out for that. It's actually very easy to do with the, the log, um, with the HA proxy config. So, what are the new levels that you go to? I've broken up into some fictitious numbers, but 
I would say this is very general and uh, very irresponsible of, of myself to put numbers against this because it's very different based off your solution. But the cluster here, that gets you to millions of nodes, right? Because if you've got, Neo by itself can do millions of nodes if the data model is, is correct, but this really alleviates the whole read-write contention and you get um, uh, free high availability for it. But if you have a huge graph, that same graph exists here, here, and here. So it doesn't happen to help too much with scalability, but more high availability. Um, it's really good at that. The next thing that's suggested is to do some routing um, uh, to get to bigger nodes is to put some routing on top of the same thing. And the idea is to utilize the cache as much as possible. So usually this is sticky sessions, that if a person's reading off one node, just bind them to that, because the chances are they'll get a lot more cache hits than cache misses if they go to another box. And finally, this. And I think Neo makes this very easy. And um, it's to get this, do it a hundred times, but then to shard your data using some key within your domain model. And for ours, it was an organization um, ID. And the reason we used ID is because it's a GUID and it's randomly generated and the ability for that to really type people in any way is not as likely as some other things like location or something like that. I think I've got two more slides. So production tips. Um, when you're deploying uh, your back-end infrastructure in your test environment, it's pretty much identical to doing it in the cloud, especially if you're doing infrastructure as a service, um, which is, here's the boxes, do what you want with them. Um, actually want to correct this. It's not Neo4j. Any smart storage in the cloud is expensive. Um, and stupidly expensive. There's this rule that dumb data is super cheap and smart, cheap, smart data will send you broke. And smart data is um, querying, is hosting graph databases. Dumb data is Dropbox, hosting files that you can download. The fact that you can search through Dropbox, that's smart, but that's expensive. Um, so always keep this in mind. Um, and, of course, Jim, um, in his book, as well as a lot of blogs from uh, the Neo Tech guys. Ian's book. Is it Ian Robert? Ian Robbins? Yeah, Jim's book you've never heard of. That's okay. Book. Okay. His name is also on the cover, though. Okay, got it. Ian will get upset if I don't. Oh. <laughs> and I don't want to upset Ian. <laughs> <laughs> I do not know who Ian is. <laughs> mm. So their common answer, and I completely agree with this, is shove more RAM into the box. Because I, I can sit here all day and say the Neo and databases are expensive in the cloud, but you're running a business. Like, it costs money to run a business. So do put RAM, the proper round of RAM. There are fantastic calculators on the Neo sites to figure out how much RAM you should put into your boxes. Case sharding, we talked about before. That's essentially just trying to hit the warm cache as much as possible and domain sharding for terabytes of data, which is this. Use something like a property key or a label to split up over multiple different clusters. Um, so, final thing. Oh no, sorry. One, okay, so, just be profile your data. That's a given. Profile your queries, because when you go to bigger nodes, you're just going to get that hit. It's going to happen pretty quickly. Use the profiler, problem solved. Um, security has to be handled by your, yourself. And I've given you a few tips on the fact that maybe you can use write time um, to put relationships in for reads and writes. It scales very well because relationships, you can put heaps of them in. Um, the path queries are a bit expensive, so just watch out for them. Um, Shortest paths are usually quite quick. They use a very quick algorithm. Um, 
But as soon as you go into, okay, go get me all the paths, you start to blow up your app. Um, and like I said before, the graph is for nodes and relationships. Don't treat it like anything else, like a blob store. Don't put properties with huge JSON blobs in it. It's going to die. Um, mainly on deserialization and serialization. So when it goes to read and write out of the graph, it's got so much more to unravel. Um, dense nodes can cause huge issues because of this fact. Um, so keep your property, keep your nodes with a small amount of properties. And um, I know that's kind of useless information because what if your domain requires you to put properties? Um, I'll say what we're trying to do. We're actually trying to break out the properties into subnodes because that just seems to be so much quicker. It kills the model, but it, 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 you don't get pretty graphs anymore, which if you're willing to put up with that, that's fine. But uh, something to look out for. So that's done. OK, so I guess this is my, um, <laughs> my one request slide of things <laughs> that maybe the product, one slide, nine million points. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so maybe the indexing stuff. Um, that Lucene is such a powerful engine. And just little things like um, when you're doing a predicate query, like a, a where query, and you use the um, uh, regular expressions. Um, or the contains or starts with. Lucene has analyzers for this that do this extremely quick. Um, so you can look up things by regular expressions in the index, and it's not doing this right now. Um, there's only one change that needs to be reverted in the UI. Uh, please agree with me. It's that stupid when you click on a property and it just bounces the screen up and down. The old property screen was fantastic. The one where you click on a node and it comes over on the right hand side, a black box, got property lists. Right now it comes down the bottom and it just flicks up and down when you click between different nodes. Has no one else, you know that? Okay. <laughs> just me, just me. <laughs> okay. Um, being a graph database, I would kind of expect this, and I assume it's in the Java API. Um, I, haven't, I, I haven't checked. But when I'm traversing a path, Neo, yeah, it does it great. But I'd like to pick what paths I want to go down in a, in a, in a fast way. Because you can physically do it right now by putting it in a predicate query where the type of relationship equals this or it equals this. None of that uses the index properly. So it, it, let's just say that I'm saying, I want to know the relationship between me and Rick, but I don't want to go, I don't want you to follow the following paths. So as soon as you, you go off and see an outgoing of this type of relationship, likes, don't go down that path. You can't do that right now. It'd be really handy. I assume Cypher will just catch up with the Java API over time and offer these functionalities. Um, one tricky thing um, that we found is that, um, let's just say you have a, a node and you put some properties on it. Um, Neo supports arrays as a property. Unfortunately, they don't go into the index. So you can't look them up via the index. So they do table scans when you look up by them. So the solution, I th I don't, I, it's a dirty solution. Break out arrays into subnodes. It solved that problem for us completely. The old legacy indexing supported it. Schema indexing doesn't. Um, ba -ba -bum. I'll skip the dense nodes. Oh, yes. Please correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like properties on relationships can't be looked up via the index either. So I'll give you an example. Um, the, the weight. That's a fantastic feature because you can sum up weights as you go along. But sometimes in your data modeling, you might want to stuff some properties onto that relationship. If you look that up, it doesn't use the index. So of course, it'll be quite slow. It'd be really good if, if we could have that. 
And uh, the final thing is uh, that the hints on indexes is great. It kind of gives everyone confidence that, yes, it's going to use the index, but it's not supported in some of the um, uh, aggregate functions. Al um, any, all, and uh, collect are examples. So that's it. Um, and thanks for listening. And uh, I hope that you do choose Neo because at the end of the day, we made a really good choice with Neo. Any technology you pick up are going to have pitfalls, and these were the ones that we met. And in the end, we got over them. So happy days. We release on the 20th of October. You can check us out at cluedin.net. Thanks a lot. Thank you.